I am Dr. Philip Vucetic, and we are at BSD CAN 2024 at the University of Ottawa. We have several folks in the room who are going to be able to be with us live, and uh, if you're not uh, in the room live, then uh, hopefully we'll see you here next year at uh, the next BSD CAN. Uh, just so everyone knows, if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to ask them you know, as they come up. Uh, my hope is, since this is the last uh, scheduled presentation of the day, uh, we'll be able to have the amount of time that you want to take uh, uh, if you have more questions, either on video or afterwards. Uh, so other, generally, I'll go through the first several slides fairly quickly because they're project uh, general overview. And so if that's not of interest to anyone, then we'll skip through those for the most part and then uh, have more depth of discussion on the uh, FreeBSD things that make it compelling for this sort of a project. So. Uh, the topic is FreeBSD is the backbone of a vaccine medication refrigerator monitoring system. And my background is I am a pharmacist by training and I do IT consulting for hospitals, health systems, and uh, I don't have any conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. Uh, a portion of the project that is being talked about was funded by a grant from the Nebraska Department of Economic Development for prototypes. And the overall uh, agenda that we're going to talk about is we'll talk about the regulatory environment since this is not a healthcare uh, conference. I'll kind of give you an overview of the regulatory environment that is relevant for this particular project. Uh, and then a project overview looking at the uh, architecture of the project because there's some IoT components of it and cellular and networking and so forth. And then I'd like to spend the most of the time on the FreeBSD component uh, discussing the uh, project management or business decisions, why FreeSB, FreeBSD makes a lot of sense for this particular use case. So the regulatory environment, uh, not everyone is familiar with the US healthcare system since we're in Canada. Uh, essentially, there's the US federal healthcare system or the US federal uh, Food and Dug Drug Administration and Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The relevant part of the CDC is that there's a Vaccines for Children program that has some guidance about how you have to manage vaccines. So that's where they fit into this particular type of a project. Uh, and each state in the US uh, has their own regulations. So if you are a clinic, if you are a pharmacy, if you are a hospital, you're probably being uh, inspected by somebody in your state. There isn't a federal regulation like there is in some countries where you have federal, regu uh, federal um, uh, inspectors, for example, unless you're in manufacturing, which is different than what this is. Then there's also non-governmental agencies that have a, a role in this. So the biggest one that uh, most people are familiar with throughout the US is the Joint Commission that accredits hospitals, health systems, uh, facilities. And uh, USP, or United States Pharmacopeia, that's been around since the 1800s, that uh, determines standards for monitoring and managing medications. And usually those come into state laws. And then what's interesting that uh, something new in 2021 is uh, NSF, ANSI, uh, created a standard for uh, how to determine if a refrigerator is able to be uh, monitored for vaccines and medication storage at a very tight controlled level. So there hadn't been a standard until 2021 specifically for vaccine medication for refrigerators. So this is an optional standard, primarily for refrigerator manufacturers to say ours complies with this. And what that means is uh, if you have a refrigerator, you know that if you put at your house, if you put lettuce in there and it freezes, that lettuce is not going to make a nice salad anymore. So the same sort of a thing happens with complex medications like proteins. So think of insulin and vaccines that if they freeze, they're probably not good anymore. If they get too warm for too long, they also degrade. So those guidelines, those temperature ranges, uh, the most important one for this particular project is we're talking refrigerators. So standard refrigerators, the guidelines are between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius, uh, which is approximately 36 to 46 Fahrenheit. So it's not freezing and it's not too warm. And there are other temperatures that are also used for different medication storages uh, for controlled room temperatures, cool and frozen and ultra cold. Uh, but just for reference, we're looking primarily at refrigerators just to keep the scope of this discussion you know, pretty simple. And no, these are not exact conversions. Uh, you might notice that there's not decibels in there because 
the way that regulations are written, they're using whole numbers. And the allowance is plus or minus uh, half a degree Celsius or one degree Fahrenheit, which again, not an exact conversion, it, but it's what's typically written in regulations and guidelines. Okay, so the project overview. At the clinic, the pharmacy, the hospital, there'd be an IoT device. So a very small device attached to the fridge, set next to the fridge. So you have a cellular connected device. So that's where you go over the internet for networking. Uh, and then you have a data logger. So you basically are gonna keep track of the data essentially forever because it's really not that much data and you might have a 10 year old fridge that you're gonna be able to record for 10 years. And then the other part is alerting. So think of your standard network monitoring system that you wanna get an alert via email, via SMS, uh, via whatever push notification service that you want that has an API to come into it that we could push something to whatever way that you wanna get it. So that is the kind of the core of the uh, architecture. If we look at the device, for those of you who like IoT devices, uh, this is using the Zephyr real-time operating system, uh, which is uh, on the Nordic Semiconductor NRF 9160 chip, which is an ARM M33. So it's a fairly constrained device, uh, looking like you know one megabyte worth of uh, space on there. Uh, and then you have your standard environmental sensors, so you have temperature and humidity. Uh, with a battery backup because one of the uh, failure modes that you want to plan for is uh, your refrigerator will go down if your mains power drops. You're, you're not going to put a refrigerator on UPS because they have too much of a power draw. Uh, you'd need to have a generator backup or a really beefy UPS if you're going to do that. So hospitals and health systems will often have uh, generator backed up power, but pharmacies and clinics that are small are not going to have a generator uh, right outside the back. So if uh, power goes out to that neighborhood, you might not have uh, power to the system, uh, you know, to, the, to your building. The network connectivity, it's using uh, cellular CAT M1, which is a low data rate, not really low, uh, but moderately low data rate. You're not gonna put video over it, uh, but you can, depending on the conditions, you can get plenty uh, of speed out of that. Uh, it uses a, an IPv4, v6 dual stack, uh, which is pretty much the default when you're talking about cellular networks in the US. Uh, from what I've seen, just based on looking at uh, the connectivity, regardless of which uh, network it's connecting to, it will often get an IPv6 address and an IPv4 address uh, assigned to the device uh, when it's connecting. Some of them only give it a, uh, uh, an IPv4 address in the carrier grade NAT range, the 100 dot whatever range. Uh, but it allows for IPv6. So having the cellular connectivity and having dual stack is important because it allows it to go pretty much anywhere. The monitoring, the uh, connectivity is via MQTT. There are other connectivity uh, messaging protocols like CoAP, which is a uh, more constrained application protocol, so it uses less data. But it doesn't, with this particular setup, it doesn't, would not allow uh, bi-directional communication. So MQTT using just one messaging platform uh, or messaging type lets us go both directions for sending updates back to the device as well as getting uh, information sensors from the device. Uh, the digital data log is on a Postgres database, so you know, nothing special as far as uh, storing uh, log data. So think of it as a log database. Uh, alerting, uh, you can put any network monitoring system on it that can get the MQTT data in. Uh, it'll send it out via email, SMS, uh, APIs to whatever you want. You know, if, you're, uh, if your company has a, uh, a messaging system that you use internally, whatever that one might be, if it has an API that we can send a message to, we can just craft the message and send it to that API. So it's really whatever API that you have for whatever system. But the, the defaults are email and SMS uh, because we can send to those things pretty reliably without having to talk to a specific uh, vendor implementation of an API. But a lot of the messaging systems have that. And so you can basically put these pieces together and uh, escalate it uh, however. So all of these pieces can work at, so far at this point on pretty much uh, several operating systems. It's not specific to a uh, particular FreeBSD, OpenBSD, Linux, et cetera. So the next part is what 
what makes FreeBSD compelling? So this is really what the, the benefit of this talk and coming to this conference to, to discuss it and for me to learn uh, from you all uh, more is for this use case, what is most important? Well, the long-term maintainability of a system. So I don't want things to change very fast, very quickly. It's a fairly stable, robust, well-defined use case that is not going to change uh, the, the primary use for, say, a decade. So you have a, a very well-defined use case. Uh, it doesn't need to scale so quickly because you're talking about also needing to create a device. So the scalability of the speed that you can create these devices is going to determine the scalability of rolling it out uh, or bringing in other devices. Uh, documentation is really critical. Uh, the reason for that is over the course of, say, 10 years, uh, we know that there's a lot of churn in the industry uh, in healthcare IT where folks move from place to place, uh, from different hospital to hospital, or from different uh, parts of the country, or have different interests. They change what they want to do. And so you can't expect that the same people who are there on day one are going to be there 10 years from now. So if you have a very good documentation of the core system, that you can just add on top of uh, your specific things, then you can bring in new people uh, to say, hey, here's the documentation from uh, FreeBSD. And so FreeBSD and OpenBSD both have excellent documentation uh, as far as the core systems uh, for how to use them. Uh, stability, the important part is that systems are going to need to get updated for patches from time to time. But in between those planned updates, I want to know that it's not just going to wig out on me, that you know, it's, it's not going to have you know, memory overloads or other unexplained behavior where you're going to have to run into that. So I want to have something that's going to be very stable. And that's where uh, FreeBSD for years has shown to be a really good use case for that. Uh, network security, using things like the, the PF uh, firewall and other tools to say, OK, well, we need to be able to protect this system uh, from uh, outside uh, threat actors uh, because it has an internet-facing component. And the last piece on why FreeBSD, actually there were some talks about this uh, before that we were uh, talking about is uh, FreeBSD works really well in an appliance model. So the models that this would likely be deployed, the server side of it would be deployed is if you have a uh, your own hardware, so great, you can run FreeBSD on your own hardware. You can run pretty much any OS on your own hardware. Uh, and then do you have good deployment options for clouds if a particular client wants to run it on their own cloud, so whichever one that might be, or one that uh, it needs to be deployed within a hospital network that's secured. So in a health system, uh, you may have heard that there are some threats uh, for security, for exfiltration of patient data, et cetera. And so hospitals are very particular about what runs on their network and are uh, uh, very, they, they have very strict requirements for what you can bring in and it takes months, if not longer, to validate a given system before it can uh, operate on a hospital network. So what this allows is it'll allow that option to be on a hospital network, but it could also be segregated where uh, the data is all cellular network, and so n it never touches their uh, patient care network. And so having cellular connectivity for the devices allows for a uh, network segregation for security purposes, not touching any patient information. So there's a, a gap. Uh, so looking at the details, I think that we're just about at the 14.1. I'm not sure where that is. Uh, it sounded like it was being built today or thereabouts. Uh, it's today. So, so my slides are already out of date. Uh, but based on the history and the announcements that for this one version, we have a five-year release cycle, which some other operating systems will say, OK, well, you need to upgrade, uh, but we don't know when you're going to upgrade, or we don't know how long we're going to support it. And so some of the uh, talks have been about long-term uh, releases no longer being long-term releases uh, from certain vendors. The, the upgrades between each version are pretty straightforward uh, to, to get new upgrades. So it's a very uh, well-documented, generally works really well plan. And then you know with uh, the documentation coming with each 
release works out really nicely in the, uh, you know what's going to change, you know what is expected to break, and so reading the release documents, it generally will tell you, okay, here's what to expect. So that works out nicely that it's not gonna be uh, a guess. Uh, as we've talked about principle of least astonishment in other talks today, and uh, that making changes just because you can does not mean you should, especially if you want it to be a stable production system. And so usually the uh, enhancements are well thought out and well planned ahead, and the common use cases are tested uh, prior to releasing a, uh, a breaking change. And they don't generally break things between major version or within the major version. So uh, the principle of least astonishment is important uh, when you're wanting to have an appliance sort of a model with that appliance model being able to be deployed out in the field without a lot of changes for 10 years. You want it to be fairly stable with planned updates. Uh, the features in FreeBSD that are especially relevant to this uh, compared to some other distribution mechanisms of uh, software was that, there's, that the ports mechanism works really well to customize it. So from a project management perspective, the packages don't always have the settings. So for example, uh, Postgres isn't the default uh, database in a number of packages. It you know, might be MySQL or MariaDB that is the primary link in certain packages. Well, having ports available for that to customize it and Poudrier to customize it uh, lets me say I want this specific uh, structure uh, of, in these particular uh, settings. Uh, ZFS is gonna be an important part and I'm, I'll get into these on the next slides as well. ZFS is pretty much, uh, I don't know, that's, it's the thing that makes it so easy to manage from a disaster recovery perspective for me, is how I think of it. That I know that if I fail, if I have a failure in one hardware, in one location, that I can get back to a known good state from a, a replication of that. And the amount of uh, tape swapping that I've had to do with previous systems uh, has been kind of a headache uh, to try to get to a known good uh, state. Uh, jails is great for management. I'll talk about why that is especially useful for me instead of, say, a, a virtual machine. Uh, PF as the firewall, which of course came from OpenBSD. Uh, I still don't understand it well enough uh, to, to do all of the things that I need to do. Uh, Dtrace uh, is, I'm not hitting the resource limits that Dtrace is gonna uh, help me understand to see what is uh, breaking when we uh, scale up because I'm still at a low level of utilization, so I'm not hitting uh, processor or memory or uh, file system limits. Uh, but as I get to there, I'm going to understand Dtrace a bit more. And one of the things I'm uh, still experimenting with is mtree for being able to take snapshots of uh, file systems or defined file systems and saying, okay, how close are you to the known file system that was released? Uh, because a lot of them are config files. Uh, instead of just uh, binaries. So in the, the ports functionality that makes it so useful is I like Postgres because I, can, I only have so much brain power. I can't learn every database that's out there. I've tinkered with half a dozen different databases as, uh, as necessary because in the healthcare system, uh, the vendor defines what database you're using for your software. And some of those have been mumps-based databases, and some have been uh, other vendor databases, and some have been, uh, I mean, anything you can imagine. Even think of any database that you've seen over the past 30 years, and it's probably in a healthcare system somewhere in some product. So a lot of the exposure to uh, databases have basically told me I, I can't learn every thing about every database. And so uh, that particular one for Postgres does everything I need it to do uh, that I can foresee in the, the foreseeable future for managing this, uh, both for the data log and for long-term maintainability and replication and so forth. 
so the ports makes it possible for me to make that small config change. Uh, the porter's handbook makes it easy to understand the difference between things like flavors and options so you can make your own uh, build. So that makes it so that I can have, uh, I'm not sure that I'd call it reproducible builds, but uh, predefined builds uh, that I'm going to be able to predefine all of the specs that I need every version uh, and bring those versions in. Uh, Poudriere fits into there because it's the tool to make that all uh, happy and manageable. Uh, to have the pre-compiled version so that I can send out a, a known version of a binary to a, uh, a cloud server or a device uh, if I need to say, okay, we're doing an upgrade from this to this. So planning for upgrades, uh, you don't want to have to recompile on every single server. You want to send out a known good binary. The, the use of the open ZFS uh, really I have used it since oh, probably more than a decade. Uh, so I have, in, I'm, I'm not the earliest adopter of it, uh, but I had used it when it was on the, uh, the open Solaris uh, platform and trying that uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago at that point. And prior to that, I think we've all had hard drive failures. And I've gotten burned by hard drive failures when you have a single hard drive and you're trying to recreate that hard drive uh, so pretty much everything is mirrored uh, at this point. And so that uh, prevents the local hard drive failure, and it's very easy to set up with one command to, you know, to get you uh, some basic uh, mirroring. And then if you have more complex scenarios, you can decide that and you know, think about that. So the single drive hardware failure of, of years past really should pretty much be gone uh, with common hardware uh, is where I'm thinking. We've even talked about the possibility of you know, having two SD cards on a small embedded device and have a, a tiny little RAID there if we can have, you know, enough capability in there, uh, you know, even on the smallest uh, single board computer devices. Uh, the integrated backup and recovery, uh, this is, you know, of course, if you don't have your backups tested, then you don't have backups. And so with the ZFS, it allows the easy validation of a backup on a remote system by just loading that uh, data set, either in read-only or rewrite mode, and then getting rid of your changes. So the, uh, the validation of backup sets has been made a lot easier with this tool. Uh, and it can also be tuned per data set. So this is uh, where we haven't really hit the performance issues, and it may cause uh, other issues on um, uh, virtualization because you might have conflicts if you put it on a virtual machine uh, that has different uh, data sizes. But on uh, hardware, you can make the record size what you want. So for a Postgres database, instead of a default, say, 128K uh, chunk, you can make it uh, 8K record size. So it can better align with the, uh, the Postgres table uh, sizes. And you can also optimize it as long as you don't have uh, the cascading uh, replication on it to uh, make it so that the ZFS handles the, uh, the checksumming instead of the Postgres, so you're not double checksumming every data block. So there's some performance things that, you know, as we scale things up, it can uh, scale up to better performance with this combination of ZFS, Postgres, FreeBSD. Uh, and of course, Compression is on by default and it's nearly free, uh, that it is pretty much at, uh, at or very close to uh, the drive speeds. So you get free compression, essentially. And uh, the, the adaptive replacement cache is another nice feature. So you throw more memory in and you get more performance out of it, is pretty much how I see it. The, Management perspective, as it starts off as a small prototype system and then grows, it's going to have more people touching more things. So the jails allows it to uh, separate out the different components. So the components of this sort of a, on the server, you of course have a database server that if you have that running in a jail uh, and you and the the database needs to have more performance, you either add more resources to the jail or you add another server and you can move the jail over to another server. Whichever way you need to do as you grow. Uh, in this component, 
Uh, you have database, you have a, a monitoring application, an extract transform load uh, tool, and a website user interface. So you have well-defined components at a small scale. Let's say you take an individual uh, hospital health system or small group of uh, clinics. If they want to have their own system uh, as an appliance model, then all of these things are not going to be heavy lifting for any commodity hardware that you can get off the shelf right now or a standard virtual machine on a cloud. Because the number of sensors and no amount of data and number of users is going to be relatively small. So you're not talking about millions of people and millions of devices. You're talking about what's going to be more important to manage on a, a few processors and you know, 8 to 32 gigs of RAM, depending on you know, how big of a system you're uh, going to need. So it's more important that it's easily manageable and the management, if you have the components separated instead of all in one management system, so you have a jail for the database, you have a jail for the extract transform load tools, uh, another one for the uh, network monitoring system, and another for the website for the end user, user interface, you can upgrade and replace each of those components and test each of those components independent of each other or move them from system to system if you need to uh, separate things out or resource constrain them uh, if you want to make sure that uh, a given component of the system is not going to take too many resources. Uh, so resources usually would be CPU uh, and network to make sure that they have uh, limits so that no one thing can get out of hand. Uh, and so those are all built into the, the base system. So it makes, it sen makes sense primarily from a management perspective uh, of, a, of an appliance. So, uh, yes, there's some security benefits to it of keeping them separate because you have to think about them as basically separate virtual machines and they're connected by a networking uh, rather than uh, all in one system where one bad behaving application could attack the others. Uh, the other component is the ability to add applications. So the, the thought of uh, adding a new jail if somebody wants new functionality, new features on the same system Let's say they don't like the network monitoring system, they have their own. Uh, you would be able to bring that in as basically a new jail, a new virtual machine, essentially. Or if there's uh, uh, another ETL that you have different sets of devices that you're bringing in that have different ETL uh, specifications. So you want to manage those separately, for example. So you can spin up new jails and manage each of those jails separately uh, very easily and it's all built into the, the core system. So it, it makes it so that the expandability is going to be important. OpenBSD PF, I was just learning about more of this yesterday at the uh, workshop, and it's well documented, uh, it's readable, so you just follow along with that. Uh, but the important thing for this is that it made it easy to route, uh, to redirect con uh, connections to jails. Uh, from the outside. So in addition to your standard firewall sorts of tools, uh, for not having to add additional things into the system, uh, you can say when you have stuff coming in for this uh, port, you're going to direct it to this jail. So the devices will be communicating on one uh, particular network port uh, coming in. Uh, website, us user website's going to come into a, you know, another uh, URL. So, but basically the core part is it makes it easy uh, to perform uh, the, the routing to get into specific jails for specific purposes. So you can then manage all of the, the jails uh, in the way that you want, whether it's SSH or whether it's uh, uh, HTTP, whatever tools that you want to use, you just point them the right ways to the right ports on the right uh, jails. So in addition to the firewall functionalities, it gives kind of a, a good redirection of uh, anything to, that you need to get to. Uh, from a management perspective. Instead of the, the alternative ways that you might have is you have to you know, put a whole other uh, load balancing web server or something on the front that's going to then be con configured separately and redirect everything. Uh, so the PF made it easy to redirect it ahead of time without uh, additional overhead. Uh, Dtrace, I've, at, at this point, my experience with Dtrace has been uh, learning to see what it can do. And when there's 80,000 or so DTrace hooks that you can look at, it's just a little bit much to get all in, in one day. Uh, 
So what I'm doing right now is because it is built into using things like Postgres, I'm looking at the optimization of Postgres. Uh, I have you know, scripts with uh, uh, Python and some basic code, uh, basic C code uh, to, to do different things. And so dtrace, I'm putting hooks into pieces to say what components are taking up the most time and what is worth optimizing. So when running synthetic loads through it, when running you know, thousands of uh, synthetic uh, sensors you know, coming through, uh, what is taking the most time? What can I improve on uh, to allow for scalability, uh, either by scaling the system down as much as possible so it can go into the smallest of uh, virtual machines uh, and still perform well, or scaling up if we need to get lots of sensors and lots of users in a, a future version of the system. Uh, as, as noted, PostgreSQL also ha it has dtrace built in uh, to its internals, so you just have to recompile it, and that again, that's where the ports comes in. Uh, you recompile it as the build option, and then you now have access to the internals for dtrace with Postgres. Uh, and you can put the, uh, the tracing in pretty much everything, and it really only uses resources when you're actively tracing. So that's where uh, having this built into the system is a, another debugging, or not debugging tool, a performance debugging tool, really, to say, what can I do better uh, for improving in a running system? And mTree, it's kind of small on there, but it, it is, uh, at this point, it's still a learning curve for me on uh, how best to use it. Uh, I'm just experimenting with it, so if anyone has some great experience with it, of reading a directory tree and saying, okay, what has changed from uh, a point of delivery, so config files especially, uh, to now, uh, and being able to zero in on config changes that have been intentional or unintentional. Uh, because if something goes into an appliance mode, there are going to be config changes, and doing the diffs on lots of config changes might be difficult if you don't have a, a short list of what to look at initially. Uh, as config files get bigger and bigger, uh, that this may be a tool to help out. So that's where I'm thinking about it, but I don't have a great uh, depth of experience on that just yet. So, so I, I've taken just a, a bit of time to focus on why FreeBSD has been good from a project management perspective, rather than uh, all the technical talks that I've enjoyed so far this uh, this uh, presentation or this uh, conference, and. The, the key takeaway for this is that it, looking at it compared to some other alternative operating systems that uh, do not have the same structure of, as FreeBSD and the, the same sort of a plan and infrastructure, that it makes a lot of sense when you're looking at a, a long-term deployment, looking at devices that are gonna be around for a decade. So small devices that are gonna be around for a decade are not gonna wanna change frequently. Uh, their firmware is gonna stay the same the purpose of the device is not gonna change, it's embedded. Uh, thinking more of a, an industrial application, sort of a model where everything just needs to work and it's gonna be there for a decade uh, as a, a typical use case, if not 20 years. Uh, so everything just needs to work all the time for a very long time and any changes need to be intentional and uh, directed and planned. So things like surprises of API changes are not welcome in, you know, in a, an operating system that needs to be around for five or 10 years uh, supporting the same devices. So that's where FreeBSD has come in um, for this particular project because it fits really well for this use case. Uh, and I'm sure there's a, a number of other reasons, uh, but I wanted to uh, open up for any discussion if anyone has questions or comments uh, about uh, what might work better or uh, what your experiences have been. Yes. So, 14 has a five year lifetime. Does that mean that you're going to convert it to this thing in five years? Or are you hoping that 14 will just carry on and just last the whole 10 years? That, that's a great question. The question is, uh, since 14 has a planned uh, five-year lifetime for support and especially for the security patches because again uh, the high risk of security patch issues is really the most important thing in this particular environment uh, because the functionality is all there it's the security that you need to make sure stays there that's where uh, 
when 15 comes along, there just needs to be a plan to switch to 15. But it's a well-known timeline of five years. So it's reasonable to plan for uh, potential breaking changes uh, when 15 comes along or to mitigate those changes in some way when 15 comes along. But the plan would be to keep up with the currently supported version. But knowing that it's there five years from now lets you plan from a, a project management perspective uh, compared to uh, if you have uh, some other uh, operating system that just changes uh, everything every year, let's say, or every 13 months, or whatever random schedule that sometimes it's in three months, sometimes it's in two years. So if you don't have a well-planned schedule, it's really hard to plan for a project to support the next version. So that's where it, the plan would be to switch to 15 in about five years, or you know, approximately when 15 is ready and tested, uh, and it's in the stable release, well, in release, uh, because it needs to go from a well-known state to another well-known state at a well-defined time. Because the other piece behind it is uh, downtime is not acceptable for any extended period of time for when you're doing monitoring. So if uh, you have a, a refrigerator, you want to be alerted when it goes out of temperature. Well, the, the switch from 14 to 15 should be able to happen seamlessly if you have them both running at the same time and you just have an A-B cutover. So it's, the plan would be to switch to 15, but it also needs to be a year out because in the healthcare environment, you don't want to surprise healthcare providers. Uh, they want to know what's the roadmap uh, because they have time constraints and resource constraints. And if you say, plan for this in you know, quarter three of 2028, you know, something like that. Here's, this is going to be a planned thing. They can put it on their calendar to know that that's going to be a project that's going to happen at that time. And if that doesn't work for them, then there's a, a long period of dialogue to say, hey, we have years ahead before this is going to happen. Uh, so we can maybe switch something over early on a new system uh, or maybe uh, hold that off for, you know, another quarter. Uh, but the, the key is that surprises are not welcome. And uh, I, th I think everyone knows on an embedded system, no one cares what the operating system is. Uh, they just want it to work. They want it to have the features that they want. And they don't want it to change once they're happy with it. Uh, so if uh, the timeline allows for bumping one server up three months ahead of time into an earlier quarter, uh, or if you have, say, three or four quarters to be able to do an upgrade, that works out really nicely that with a lot of health system software, uh, you know what's uh, being released each quarter uh, because there's a roadmap for your particular software vendor. And then you are expected to take that release at some point within some fixed period of time, whether that's three months or a year. It depends on the software and the vendor. Uh, but they'll say it's available for anyone now. And then you have this long before we stop supporting that version of it. Uh, without extraordinary measures. So for a follow-on to that, then certain vulnerabilities come out, and you need to fix that now. Yes. And if they don't schedule well, they'll uh, uh, obviously have to have some other mechanism to be allowed to go in and, and make these changes if we're not adding them to the database. Yes. So the, the question is, if you have security vulnerabilities, how do you fix those? Well, that's where you'd say, if there's a security vulnerability, we immediately do what we can to get that patched as soon as we're allowed to patch it in your environment. Uh, and just be absolutely clear to say, here's what the CVE is. Here's what the risk is. And if you uh, can't take the patch yet, how do you protect your network if it's on your network? How do you protect your network from this risk? Uh, do you block certain ports? Do you just you know, prevent certain functionality? Do you put a different sort of a firewall? Do you isolate it? You know, what can you do uh, in your network? And uh, that was one of the designs for this particular system is that the device that would have to go at the, uh, the, the clinic, pharmacy, hospital would be a cellular device, so completely external to their network. So the ability to say, we're not touching your network at all is actually uh, a benefit to say, if there's a security risk that is in, say, FreeBSD or any of the components that we use, it will not risk your patient data. 
uh, because there's an air gap between a cellular device, which is really, from a communication perspective, no different than somebody walking around with a cell phone in their pocket. So the risk of somebody walking around with a cell phone in their pocket versus this device is about the same on your network, which is pretty much non-existent unless somebody has extraordinary capabilities uh, to get into that device and to bridge it over to your network in some way where the radios aren't there. It's just cellular radio. So if the device is off of your network and the server is off of your network, uh, then you basically have no exposure to the risk uh, that would affect FreeBSD or any of the components on it. Uh, the only risk, if it uh, were to be able to bridge over a web browser, for example, if that were uh, one of the ways that it could get out of the system in some way, uh, would be the only risk. Uh, and then you'd just basically say, fix it immediately on, on our system uh, before it's usable by them again. Does that answer your question? Okay. So, the third piece of my question is, uh, yes, a fourth team is, has five years, but in fact, a system, new systems come out about every two and a half years. So this team is gonna come out about two and a half years after the fourth team is released. And the sixth team will be the one that's actually being released during five years from now. Okay, yeah. So I like using the most recent version that is stable. So I usually like to run the release version. So I'm not as brave as some that will run current. Uh, so, uh, because I, I like to go from a known good uh, release to another known good release. Uh, and if there's an issue with one, there, there's good documentation behind it from one to the next. Uh, and that's where without a large infrastructure team to track current and to be able to fix all of the, uh, the things that will happen in live development, uh, it's easier to go with a release version from one release version to the next. So the actual plan is that uh, typically every quarter there would be uh, a, a planned uh, AB release. So all of the infrastructure uh, on FreeBSD would have two servers that would be running uh, one would get upgraded and the other would wait, and then the other would get upgraded. So uh, you'd have uh, a plan of, uh, a cadence of typically quarterly updates uh, that would be uh, approximately quarterly, uh, depending on when the releases come out for the, the patch levels. So uh, a scheduled time where it would swap, one would go out of the network uh, and one would take its place, uh, using ZFS, it would basically be a planned failover. Uh, so the other benefit of that is that uh, if they're on the same network, it's really fast for doing the ZFS, and then you uh, take one out, and then you bring the other one up, and you basically have uh, an, an outage that is <coughs> close to zero. Um, and in this particular environment, an outage that's close to zero is not noticeable uh, because, again, you're doing temperature monitoring. You know, a one minute outage when switching from one to the other would have a delay of say a minute. Well, fridges don't change that temperature that fast where a one minute delay uh, is gonna be a big deal. The more important thing is that there's no data loss uh, because it is uh, very, very important to not have data loss when you're doing data <laughs> logging uh, with this because there may be regulatory requirements where you need to show that you have all of the, the sensors within the time period. Now again, they're not as tight uh, of regulations uh, where every minute counts, uh, but the data will eventually come in and that's where the uh, Mosquito or MQTT messaging uh, comes through because it does a, a cache of the sensor data and then I pull the cache through the ETL tool. And so even if my server is down for five minutes, when it reconnects to the uh, Mosquito, it's gonna grab that. And so you'd have say a five minute delay of getting an alert out uh, if the temperature was too high. So that sort of a tolerance is acceptable uh, if it's planned. And so you'd say we have a planned outage of you know, five minutes or you know, just a half hour block on a given day at a given time and say here is what the planned end user outage is but we're not gonna lose any data. So the, the loss of data is not acceptable. Brief scheduled outages are. So it, again, it's part of the use case of saying what is acceptable, what's not uh, for a given use case. And so the, the question of uh, how quickly do you upgrade, 
most likely, I, I like to have scheduled upgrades and about quarterly t seems to be about the tolerance uh, in the healthcare environment of you plan a, an upgrade every quarter uh, to say here's what's coming. Not every month, that's a little bit too frequently, and not every year that may not be frequently enough to capture uh, routine uh, patches and so forth. Oh, okay. That's a good question. The question is uh, whether we're using an external Mosquito server or whether we're using our own Mosquito server for MQTT messages. And right now, the uh, both options are there. So we have a Mosquito server running uh, as one pathway option. Uh, however, that creates the risk that if our system goes down that you have uh, data that's not coming in right now and uh, then you have to plan for how does that catch up and so you have the pub sub for Mosquito where you have guaranteed delivery so you'll get it. Uh, however, we're using the, because we're using a particular Nordic chip that's a cellular chip, uh, one of the things for being able to flash firmware over the air to cellular devices, it's easier at this point to have a a system, so in this case it's Nordic's cloud, uh, and they happen to run on AWS, so they are getting the initial MQTT messages right now, and they're caching them for 30 days, and then we pull them through their API through the ETL tool to upload it to network monitoring and data log. Uh, and with that 30-day cache, in theory, if this system went down for 30 days, it would still be able to catch up. Now, granted, you would get alerts for 30 days, and that wouldn't be acceptable. But just as far as data loss goes, uh, right now it's using an external MQTT, uh, and that can send it uh, to anything uh, through the APIs that are there. Uh, but the thing that that really gives us is the ability to easily do firmware over the, over the air and device management. So uh, if you haven't looked into uh, device management things like embedded device management, it can get really complicated. And the embedded device management is um, more complicated than I wanted to deal with initially. And so letting it be offloaded to that Nordic cloud uh, at like 10 cents a device a month for their component of it, uh, you know, plus it makes it so that uh, it's not worth developing an in-house solution at this point uh, until there's a justification to manage devices in a different way. Uh, and I think many of the uh, <clears throat> virtual mobile network operators, as well as the actual mobile network operators, they have their own IoT management plan uh, where using uh, lightweight machine-to-machine -machine, uh, messaging, you can manage your own device and burn firmware to it through their systems uh, at a, usually you know, a cost per device or cost per firmware or cost per data you know, sort of a plan. Uh, so at this point, it doesn't make sense for us to rebuild that sort of an infrastructure. It makes more sense to use uh, the Nordic one because they make the chip, and they've already tested it with their system, and it's really easy. You just uh, upload a firm firmware, put all the devices that you want to upgrade at a given time into a group, and then push it out to those devices. And uh, over the next uh, hour or so, it pushes it out to all the devices and verifies that it upgraded them, and then they're happy. So. When they have that sort of tooling, uh, it makes it easy to use instead of building it myself. Uh, and I know there's other uh, uh, systems that do the same sort of a thing for uh, mobile device management. Uh, but sometimes rolling your own tools is not worth doing it for uh, things that are over the cellular network because that has other regulations. There's a lot of uh, requirements that the cellular carriers require. You can't make your own uh, firmware for the cellular device, you have to use their modem uh, unless you want to spend the, uh, the time and development to get them to verify. So the, think of the cellular carriers. They have to verify that your firmware is allowed to be run on their network. And by your firmware, it's, it's the modem part that lets them uh, brick your device if they don't want you to talk on their network. So it's, it's that part of it, not the application uh, that would be 
uh, limited to the uh, cellular carrier. Does that answer your question on? I'm sorry, I didn't understand it well enough. Okay, it, the, the different parts is on the IoT device, it will display it on a small screen. Right now it's an e-ink display uh, on a small screen, uh, but it could be really any device uh, that would show the, the real-time temperature. Uh, the FreeBSD part is the server that's receiving that data for data logging and alerting. So the, the key part about the FreeBSD is that uh, any individual small device is going to get lost, damaged, stolen, destroyed, broken, whatever. So you need to be able to, uh, for regulatory reasons, you need to uh, be able to report on the temperatures for you know, months, if not years, to say that you're monitoring your device and that's where the free BSD comes in for the data logging and alerting. So if it's say three in the morning on Saturday and you know, you've been uh, out away from your pharmacy or clinic and nobody's there, so it's not a 24 hour operation, if you have a local uh, temperature monitoring, a thermometer that just beeps, there's nobody here to, to hear the beep. So that's where the free BSD side comes in that it needs to be working all the time, easy to maintain, because you need to get that alert via email or SMS or a push notification on your, your phone or other device uh, reliably. Uh, and it needs to be easy to maintain from a, a system perspective because you don't want to have to do more care and feeding of a, a server than you have to. Does, okay. Yes? Uh, the question is, are there areas where FreeBSD can be improved to build a better system? Uh, well, there definitely are. I, I think most of my challenges with uh, FreeBSD have been on trying to get it to work on small hardware like a notebook computer. Uh, so for example, on the later generations of uh, notebook computers, there have been uh, incompatibility. So it's really not on the server side. Uh, it would be nice to have more uh, automation tools that are in the system uh, yes, but I think that a lot of that is going to be uh, purpose specific. Uh, well, for example, uh, some of the automation that's there when you're doing an upgrade, it does a boot environment, it brings up into that boot environment. If uh, anything beyond that, to, to be able to say you have a known good environment that, that's automatically verified uh, would be nice to know rather than you boot up and you find that it doesn't work. So in an appliance, is there a way for it to do self-verification to say that it's ready to go? And you might have to add that own tooling yourself. If it were built into the base system, uh, it would be nice to know, okay, this is ready to go and it self-signs that it's happy you know, as a device. Uh, another thing that would be nice for scaling it down, right now I have to use a, uh, a, a real-time operating system on the device because it's resource constrained, it's very small. Uh, Having uh, two ZFS uh, SD cards and being able to run ZFS in a very memory limited way would be really cool because then you'd have one operating system throughout the in entire infrastructure. Because uh, there could be some really good use, use cases at the small scale on single board computers with FreeBSD uh, and ZFS you know, plugging that in. Yes, you can run it on small devices with UFS, uh, but it'd be neat to be able to run it with the uh, the safety of having uh, ZFS mirrored between two tiny SD cards that are industrial SD cards, you know, that can handle uh, warmer environments. I, I mean, there's some things that would be nice. I'm not sure if uh, there's enough use cases to to say, hey, FreeBSD, you know, prioritize these things because they're more very specific use cases. Um, and uh, like, for example, notebook computers, maybe it's easier to get a, a different notebook computer. Uh, sometimes than it is to figure out the the anomalies on one given notebook computer uh, to say why does it have you know a drivers that don't work so well with it uh, or drivers aren't supported on it. Uh, 
I mean, those would be nice to have, but I think as far as a, a core operating system, it has, it's the best that I have seen for doing uh, long-term maintenance uh, to say, this is gonna meet my needs best. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I, I mean, there's, there's always things that can be improved, but it, they have to be deliberately improved for a given reason to be able to justify spending the time on it. Uh, and to say, is the use case uh, going to be good enough? Is it gonna cause that much of a benefit? Uh, I mean, there's lots of neat things that can be done, uh, like making my notebook computer work. Well, it can be done, but is it worth the time to develop for this one specific set of hardware? Uh, probably not. Uh, so that's where, if there's enough use cases, I think that's where coming to the meetings like this, we have the, the dialogues in the hallway and the uh, birds of a feather uh, sessions. And uh, Michael Dexter has these weekly meetings uh, that we're you know, sometimes on the phone uh, talking about what are the use cases, uh, what are ways that things can be improved. So I, I think there's a lot of things that are being discussed and I think things will bubble up to the top to be able to prioritize uh, what will meet most people's needs uh, for development options coming in the future, uh, rather than just Phil's you know, preferences. Yeah. Sure. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, what is the use case uh, for your users upgrading from, say, 14.0 to 14.1? Is it going to be through the web interface on the appliance? Is it going to be you, as the appliance provider, log into the thing and type the magic commands? Is it going to be you ship out a mem stick that they you know put in and if, if it feeds that mem stick it feeds from that and then otherwise it feeds from the source of storage um because that seems to be the big problem in appliances is it's a multi-step upgrade yeah it's it's you know you install the kernel you install the user land you upgrade the packages you reboot yeah. you cross your fingers you hop on one foot and jump up and down yeah uh, so the, the question, yeah, yeah. The the question is, what's the upgrade plan on appliances? And the the whole system service plan is as close to white glove as you can get. Right. That because healthcare and because healthcare has money, you can afford to do that. Okay. That uh, it's it's that the people who need this don't want to manage it; they just want it to work. Right. So whatever needs to happen, that it works and it's all included as you have these devices, they do the thing you want them to do, and we take care of all the other stuff. So it's not you tell them to go find a DJ monitor and a USB keyboard and plug in and run these commands, it's we'll even ship you a new appliance, you ship the old ones out. Yeah, and, and realistically, uh, it's more going to be, they don't even want an appliance, they just want the system and the service uh, to be done. You had mentioned on-premises. So yeah, so ones that want it on-premises, would be able to have their IT folks manage it in however they choose to, but it would be a virtual machine. It could be shipping out a new virtual machine okay. and just pulling over the database from the old one. Um, I don't work in the embedded space, but I work in the space where we found a lot of machines deployed out in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you a funny use case here. It's a little bit outside the scope of this talk, but in 2020, when nobody would go to a data center <laughs> for us ever, we discovered that my coworker had left a number of FreeBSD 8.x machines out in the wild. <laughs> <laughs> With yeah. root partitions that were too small to take a nine. Oh, okay. <laughs> so if you want to talk to me, I can tell you all about booting into memory file systems and caving over your entire disk. <laughs> Just come find me. Okay. It's not hard to spot. <laughs> The, uh, for those who are listening and recorded, the comment was, you know, you have a lot of edge cases, a lot of use cases for embedded systems where you need to plan for upgrading, especially if, uh, if the systems are inaccessible for one reason or another. Yeah. Okay, th I think we are out of time at this point. Thank you everyone for coming and uh, being here. <laughs>